only antidote to that is our unity. I know, as I said yesterday, that there are already efforts to move Africa in the direction of unity at the economic front, but the suspicions in Africa are too great. The African politician is perhaps, with due respect to them, Africa's curse. The day the African politician realizes that the occupation of political office and political space is one of servant leadership, that is the day Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician realizes that the occupation of public space and public office is an honor and a privilege, that is the day Africa begins to move in the right direction. The day the African politician recognizes that the occupation of office is not one for the privatization of public wealth, that is the day Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician recognizes that they do not have the monopoly of wisdom, that is the day that Africa will begin to move in the right direction. The day the African politician realizes that longevity in office is not the solution to African problem. That is the day Africa begins to end. The day that the African politician begins to remember that the electoral vote is a child for them to deliver on health, on agriculture and education. That is the day Africa will begin to know her place in the world. The day the African politician is liberated from the chains of greed, that is the day that Africa <laughs> is liberated. And I say all that because it is not lost on me that one of the reasons why Africa cannot unite is because we have become so used as politicians in Africa to our little countries where we are treated like demigods. And because we too, we who are the led, we have treated our leaders as demigods for too long and they now are conditioned to believe that they are gods. You know, respecting leaders is a good thing because that is what is right. Once you have given people the privilege to serve you, you give them respect. But respect must be earned. Many times in my own country in Kenya, I see the individuals, some of the individuals that we elect into public office, some are fine, but some are not. In fact, most are not. And in my rural village, they elect some semi-illiterate individual who everybody knows is semi-illiterate and everybody knows he is not wise. <laughs> but the day after his election, when he attends a forum such as this, those who invite him to speak will say, let so-and-so whom we elected yesterday share his wisdom with us. And I want to assure you that there is no magic in the ballot box. If you are a dunderhead, the mere fact that you have been elected does not convert you into anything. You just remain an elected dunderhead. And Africa has no shortage of dunderheads who are leading her in the wrong direction. The direction of disunity. I am telling us, as I remember the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma, that now, as you turn in your grave, if you had been alive, you'd possibly be 107 years today. But you are people, some of them, in their lack of wisdom chose to remove you from power 
I apologize on their behalf. They gave you only a few years to be present in this world. And during those few years that you are present in this world, you shook not only Ghana but Africa so very fundamentally that although your mortal remains were interred, your spirit is alive and well. And is that spirit that occupies our minds and hearts today as we remind ourselves that the only way in which Africa will realize our potential is through the path of unity. I know as you lie in your grave, great Osagiefo, there is a sense in which in a manner so completely invisible to us, you are turning uncomfortably and weeping uncontrollably because your continent is bleeding. It is bleeding in every corner. In our heart in the Congo, she bleeds. That country that is so rich is yet the poorest nation in Africa. But it does not stop bleeding only in the Congo. It also bleeds in our home in Somalia. That country which could be very rich is only famous for the wrong things. Men killing men for no reason. But it doesn't stop bleeding there. It is also bleeding in our armpit in Equatorial Guinea. That country that God gave so much oil. That oil was long captured by one family and they are using it for their benefit to the detriment of their people. And it doesn't stop bleeding there in Central African Republic and in Libya and in Mauritania and in Mali. Your continent is torn asunder. And we who have gathered here today are asking ourselves the fundamental question, what must we do to save Africa? And that is why today when we are looking at Africa and when we are remembering you on that 24th day of May in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, we cannot help but remember how animated you are. We cannot help but remember that what you saw 50 years ago is turning out to be as evergreen as when you spoke them. You told us then that our unity was going to be our salvation from other civilization. Today, Africa is said to be rising, but the question we are asking, for whom is Africa rising? Today, the minerals in our belly are being exploited, Osagiev. The uranium in Niger is being taken away from France to France. The manganese in Ghana, in your own country, is being taken away. Even the cocoa, which you must cons have consumed as a young man, is taken away in the same manner that God made it to be converted into something in Switzerland. Your people have not learned to, learn to add value to it. They have an apology for a factory in Takoradi, but it does very little, Osagiev. In other words, there is a lot to be done. We can hear you telling us that we need to have free movement of goods and services in this continent. I can now inform you that when they met on the 27th day of July in Kigali, Rwanda, they created a passport, but that passport is only known to the president. The people of Africa have no idea what it is. But they have started, so we must believe 